<laughs> the deal is I had cataract surgery on Thursday and I'm dizzy and a little disoriented. <laughs> yeah, it's true. And I'm worried I'm going to be able, not going to be able to pull this stock off, but we'll see. Yes, I have a lot of stuff. It's so true. Okay. So the title of this talk, always tough. I never know what to call it. Um, we might as well just say it. Uh, mind and thing are indistinguishable. This is a line from Trusting the Heart Mind. But first, I just want to um, say, uh, so on, on a couple of weeks ago, I had an MRI of my inner ear canal. Suffice it to say, everything was normal. But there's always the issue of claustrophobia. And so I'm and so they can sedate you, but I didn't want to go through that. And I was kind of in a in a bitchy mood, to be honest. I didn't want to do this, but I felt I had to. So uh, the technician, Matt, was very patient with me. And they had to do an enhancement, gadolinium. So they have to start an IV, you know. But um, so I'm in the MRI. And I can't believe how noisy it is. If any of you has ever had an MRI, you should know that it is just the noise. I can't believe a machine can make so many different loud noises. And um, in a way it was, it was antithetical to becoming claustrophobic. So that was nice because I didn't want to take any drugs just because I didn't. Um, and uh, so the, the tech and I could be in direct communication. And in fact, I even had a panic button so that if I started to get too anxious, I could press the panic button. But he would talk to me while I was in the scanner and he would say, um, I'm sorry, I'm a little dizzy because of this surgery I had. I've got stuff going on in my peripheral vision over here in this eye and I'm dizzy. But he, um, he would tell me what to expect. And, and then he would tell me how long the series of, of images would take. And at one point, and then he would come, you know, then they would start up and then he'd come back on and we'd do the next sequence. And at one point he said, now in this next sequence of images, the noise is going to be so loud that it's actually going to shake the table that you're on. And sure enough, it shook the table I was on. Um, and at one point I thought, what if I meditated? But that was simply out of the question because it was just too darn noisy in there. So then I tried reciting the Xin Ching Main because we recited every other Friday. And I love the Xin Ching Main. In fact, I'm going to talk a little bit about it, but um, couldn't make it through. Got maybe halfway through. And I thought, okay, I'll switch to the Fukan Zengi because I know that pretty well. So I made it through the Fukan Zengi, um, just reciting it to myself, because if I had been reciting it out loud, Matt would have been able to hear me. But, um, and it, it was very helpful. I was grateful to Dogen. And then I may be dizzy, but I have a good memory. So <laughs> being dizzy doesn't interfere with that. Is this okay, by the way? Good. Um, <clears throat> so, it was just to make a little, just to sort of set the stage for I don't know what. So Steve Hagen is teaching a class now called A Vocabulary of Enlightenment. And on Tuesday night, the first class, um, he brought up something I've heard him say many times before. But like a good Zen student, as Suzuki Roshi says, when my talk is over, your listening is over, you don't have to remember anything I've said. Well, I'd forgotten Steve had ever said it. Um, but when he said it, it, it was um, helpful in a way that uh, it's always helpful, but it was like I was hearing it again for the first, hearing it for the first time. So I'm gonna sort of set the stage for that. I'm reading from his book, page 63, 
the grand delusion. By the way, he's using this book for the class. Um, and he's reading, he's uh, going through the glossary. So on page 63, it says, this is Steve addressing anyone who is um, the foil. He's actually the protagonist. Anyway, he wants Steve to pin down what he's saying up to this point. And Steve says, illusion is devoid of any intrinsic substance beyond, beyond mere appearance. Yet, though reality is non-substantial, reality nevertheless appears substantial. That's the grand illusion. The fact is, all phenomena are devoid of intrinsic substance, and hence, all are illusory. All right, so basically, what he said was, he talked about the necessity. It's absolutely necessary that all phenomena be devoid of solidity, substantiality, own being, svabhava. And why is that? <laughs> Because if that were not the case, nothing would show up. Nothing. We would not experience, we would not have experience, immediate direct experience. We would not know, and we know this directly, wholeness and totality. If there were not, if, appear, if um, there were substantiality. So the fact that we are always dealing with illusory appearances is a wonderful thing. <laughs> There's nothing, it's, it's, it's how what we have and what we experience can show up at all. Now that's a very startling statement and I don't know, I fully understand it, but there's a part of me that really resonates to that. Um, and some people are looking puzzled <laughs> um, and it is puzzling. Because as Steve points out repeatedly in The Grand Illusion, we firmly, totally are convinced of the substantiality of what we see and of what we experience. Um, and Steve used to hold up a cup, which used to drive me crazy and talk about how, you know, this is just an illusory appearance. Yes. And it's a lovely cup. I appreciate whoever got me the water in this cup, you know, but there's that. And it, it's holding water. And you think, well, if it's not substantial, how could it possibly hold water? And yet, as Steve points out, and I don't know. Um, so, well, I'll get to this. I'll get to this. Hang on. Like I said, I don't know if I'm going to be able to pull this talk off. Um, as it says in the Heart Sutra, Avalokiteshvara Bodhisattva, when practicing deeply the perfection of wisdom, perceived that all five skandhas are empty and was saved from all suffering and distress. So just, just to bring up, just to remind you, because like good Zen students, you've probably forgotten because it was given in other talks. The five skandhas are form or appearance, sensation, conception, thinking, idea, making, inclination, which is will, intention, uh, motive, and perception, even perception, even awakeness, awareness, is empty of any kind of self-nature. As um, Steve has pointed out numerous times, the Buddha has said that all we have is stream, not particles bobbing in the stream, but nothing but streams. Santana, I love that word, Santana. I can see a stream when I say the word Santana. So anyway, 
And then Steve said, and I've heard it's, yes, about the nothing would show up if this were not, if all five skandhas were not empty of self-nature, then nothing would show up. We, have, we think, we truly think, and it's okay, there's nothing wrong with this, that we have separately existing, independently persisting things, including us, ourselves. Um, that we don't, that all five skandhas are empty, um, means then that we can experience this vibrant, immediate, sometimes painful, sometimes difficult, sometimes dizzying wholeness and totality. So Steve Matusha has talked about this also. Um, this has been expressed actually in many different ways. Uh, when we try to grasp hold of something, anything, as itself, as itself, like this cup, excuse me. This one I'm picking up this cup and I'm counting on it holding this water. So I'm picking it up as itself. When we do that, and we imagine this, or I imagine this to be an independently existing and persisting thing. Instead, what I'm actually doing is picking up or including with it the whole universe. Nothing is left out of the experience, nothing. It doesn't matter what, what the object is. Um, nothing is left out of the experience. If we just let go of the, uh, the idea of the object as something that is immediately, that is persisting, existing, um, staying the same, not changing over time. Um, so um, in Buddhism, plain and simple, did I forget it? Yes, I did. Um, that's okay. Sure, I have the page number. <laughs> Thank you. I thought I had everything I needed. No. This is what comes of feeling dizzy. Um, I can blame anything I want. Thank you so much. Thank you. So on page 79 of Buddhism, Plain and Simple, the reason I'm referencing what Steve says is because he says it succinctly, and I didn't say this particularly succinctly, but in the chapter entitled Wisdom, actually Morality, Steve says, um, And it's not on that page. <laughs> Good boy, I did well here. He talks about Thich Nhat Hanh. Where is Thich Nhat Hanh? I'm going to drive David crazy. This drives David crazy when I um, look around for stuff. The gist of it is Thich Nhat Hanh points out to us, as Steve says in the book, um, he reminds us that this book is not merely this book. It is the sun as well. After all, if not for the sun, trees would not grow to produce the pulp, to make the paper. And then he talks about um, the fact that Gutenberg invented the printing press, uh, which enabled us to put this down on paper, and that we have soil, we have air, we have oxygen, and eventually, if we're just paying attention, eventually the whole universe is included in um, the fact that this book, a piece of paper, a zafu, shows up at all. Uh, we cannot grab hold of one particular thing without including with it the entire universe. Um, 
I think people don't have a lot of patience with that, but that's okay. And there are different ways to say this. Now I know I have my copy, the champ book. So in trusting the heart mind, it says, in emptiness, mind and thing are indistinguishable and each contains within itself the whole world. So in Buddhism, there are six senses, um, sight, sound or hearing, taste, touch, smell, and thought. And there are six sense organs, eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, and mind. So mind and thought uh, are the sixth sense organ and the sixth sense. So that's unique to Buddhism. Um, so the Xin Qing Ming is saying that in this, our experience of the sixth sense, if we're just not grasping anything, we can see that he says mind and thing, mind, okay, mind and thing are indistinguishable. And each contains within itself the whole world. So he's pointing to the fact that when we do not separate out mind and thing, when we are not using our very powerful intellects to grasp at something, anything, an idea, a belief, an opinion, um, a conception of this cup is solid or substantial, then there is, then they are indistinguishable. The sense and the sense organ are indistinguishable. I like the word indistinguishable because it gets rid of the dichotomy, same and different. I could say they're the same, but then there's the opposite of that, which is different and somehow indistinguishable um, seems much more elegant to me and avoids that dichotomy of same and different. Uh, He also, in the Sin Chin Ching Ming, it says, um, later, it says, when no discriminating thoughts arise, the mind ceases to appear. So when we're not, so the nature of thought, of thinking, is to discriminate, to separate out this from that. Uh, when there's no discriminating, no holding on to this in preference to that, no grasping, then the mind does not appear. We don't experience this separation of mind and object, of um, sense organ and sense, that which is sensed. The sense of me here disappears. And so when mind vanishes, things for the object of mind follow it. Um, somewhere. Yeah. So Norm does talk about this. Norm will say, all beings are mutually supporting each other. This is how Norm expresses it that mind and thing are each are indistinguishable and each contains within itself the whole world. We get confused by the words mutually supporting. Thinking they imply uh, goodwill or um, an intention to benefit, but that's not what he's saying when he says all beings are mutually supporting each other. He's saying, that without our beings contributing to um, this immediate direct experience, nothing would show up. In that way, all beings are mutually supporting one another. Um, for any one seemingly separate thing or being, and beings can be anything. This is a being. This is a being. This being, 
uh, my dizziness, <laughs> the stuff going on in my eye right now, those are beings. Um, for any seemingly separate being to show up, to appear, the entire world is necessary. The whole world supports or makes this possible, um, makes the appearance possible. This is emptiness. I really like the way Norm puts it. Um, uh, I'm getting tired, but I have a lot more to say. So maybe I'll just say, are there any questions or comments at this point? I know I'm in trouble when there are no questions or comments. So Red Pine, I'm gonna to turn to Red Pine now, who quotes, why I took this on, I don't know. Um, he quotes Wang Po, who makes has commentary on the Diamond Sutras, as it turns out, which we're studying in, in Steve's wonderful class, second part of the Diamond Sutra, so on page 68, Red Pine quotes Wang Po, I can't believe I took this on, says, most people allow their mind to be obstructed by the world and then try to escape from the world. They don't realize that their mind obstructs the world. So what does he mean by that? They don't realize their mind obstructs the world. Well, he's pointing to this, this delusion of being convinced that illusory appearances are not illusory. That um, that the mind is active, taking up concepts, grasping them, holding on to them, and then believing in their reality, believing in their substantiality. Um, this is the way the mind obscures the world or obstructs the world. And um, Steve also taught a class prior to this one called Totality and Non-Obstruction on, on that very topic. Um, but anyway, I don't want to go there. This is hard enough as it is. Um, so Wang Po, let me read that again. Most people allow their mind to be obstructed by the world by belief um, in the substantiality of things and then try to escape from the world. I find that very interesting. We try to escape from the world. We miss what is really the source of confusion. The world is not the source of confusion. Our minds, and this is not a negative thing, are the source of confusion. He says, they don't realize their mind obstructs the world. If they could only let their minds be empty, the world would be empty. Don't misuse the mind, he says. If you want to be free of the world, you should forget the mind. Once you forget the mind, uh, the world becomes empty. Our experience of reality shifts. It changes radically. We're not caught by appearances, illusory appearances. Not that we can ever dismiss illusory appearances, as Norm talks about when he says, don't be a damn fool and walk in front of a bus. You know, I mean, um, he says, once you forget the mind, oh, I'm sorry, if you want to be free of the world, you should forget the mind. Forget the mind, meaning just let these appearances show up and go away, show up and go away. I mean, this is our Zen practice. He says, um, and when the world becomes empty, the mind disappears. That's what the Xin Ching Ming says. The Xin Ching Ming says, when no discriminating thoughts arise, the mind ceases to appear. When mind vanishes, things or the world follow it. 
Object is object for the subject. Subject is subject for the object. And then he, I love this. He says, the thoroughgoing relativity of these two, of mind and of um, that which is conceived of by the mind, of object and subject, this thoroughgoing relativity is originally one emptiness. Without one, the other doesn't show up. They're thorough. They, re, they are completely interdependent upon each other. Um, yeah. He says, once you forget the mind, the world becomes empty. And when the world becomes empty, the mind disappears. This is that dynamic of the thoroughgoing relativity of mind and thing. And then he says, if you don't forget the mind and only get rid of the world, which we can't do, we can't get rid of the world, can't get rid of illusory appearances. He says, you only succeed in becoming more confused. Thus, it is, as it is said, all things are only mind. And then he says, but the mind cannot be found. Some separately existing, persisting uh, sense organ, the mind cannot be found. And I can't give this example. Steve does a much better job, but he talks about the experience of smelling a flower. Where exactly is that experience? Is it in the flower? Is it in our nose? Is it in our brain? Again, this is the thoroughgoing relativity of the senses and the object of the senses. Again, I sound like I know what I'm talking about, but that's a bit of an illusion. <laughs> and I don't expect you to believe anything I say. Find out for yourself. Don't believe what I say. Uh, he says, but the mind cannot be found as any separately existing, persisting sense organ. When you can't find the thing, a thing, you have reached the final goal. Why bother running around looking for liberation? This is how you should, should control your mind. So this is in reference to um, Sabuti in the Diamond Sutra asking the Buddha, uh, how should a bodhisattva um, control their thoughts, among other things? How should they sit? How sh should they stand? How should they walk? How should they control their thoughts? So this is Wang Po addressing that question. He says, once you see your own nature, you won't have any deluded thoughts. Our own nature, this is not something separate and apart from what we experience. This is experience. We are this experience. We are not separate from indistinguishable from totality, wholeness, reality. And Steve, unless I'm misinterpreting what he says, says this all the time. Um, he says, once you have no deluded thoughts, you have controlled your mind. This is not a permanent state. Uh, this is not something that you can say, yes, I have no more deluded thoughts. I have controlled my mind. Forget that. That's more delusion. Um, just like when I was in the scanner and I noticed uh, if I just stayed as fully present as I could, I would not be subject to claustrophobia. It seemed that just as being as fully present as I could to all the noise and the um, classical music that I couldn't hear coming into the headphones, then I would be less vulnerable to feeling claustrophobic. It was very interesting. Anyway, um, this is not going to be a whole talk, a whole hour. Now I'm going to turn to Suzuki Roshi and Zen Mind Beginner's Mind. One of the reasons for this is because the bookmark that I have from page 68, at least I thought I did. 
Um, and I may have lost the book mark. Well, 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 here it is. This was a gift from Jose, actually, this gift mark, this bookmark. And I had it mark, marking page 68. And on the bookmark, it says, it's a quote by Suzuki. I'm really grateful to this, Jose. It was great. It's, he says, quote Suzuki, nothing outside yourself can cause any trouble. Nothing. So this is when the war, we, so we look out to the world and we think that's the source of our problem, our disturbance, our unhappiness. Um, as he says, as uh, Heinbo says, we try to escape from the world. But Suzuki says, nothing outside yourself can cause any trouble. You yourself make the waves in your mind. If you leave your mind as it is, and he doesn't mean the sense organ mind. He says, if you leave your mind as it is, it will become calm. This mind is called big mind. So now, so David doesn't yell at me. I actually have a page in Zen Mind Beginner's Mind. So I'm going to start with the prologue. I love the prologue to this book. It's about beginner's mind. That's really what we're talking about here, beginner's mind. Or we could say that, you know, I'll say that. Um, he says, people say that practicing Zen is difficult, but there is a misunderstanding as to why. It is not difficult because it is hard to sit in the cross-legged position or to attain enlightenment, he says. It is difficult because it is hard to keep our minds pure and our practice pure in its fundamental sense. He says, and then he goes on. He says other things, but then he says, for Zen students, the most important thing is not to be dualistic. Our original mind, the wholeness, totality, includes everything within itself. It is always rich and sufficient in itself. I just think that's so beautiful. You should not lose your self-sufficient state of mind. This does not mean a closed mind, but actually an empty mind and a ready mind. If your mind is empty, which Red Pine, which Wang Po talked about, we want the world to go away. But Suzuki, as did Wang Po, as did the Xin Ching Ming, it says, if your mind is ready, is empty, it is always ready for anything. It is open to everything. In the beginner's mind, there are many possibilities. In the expert's mind, there are a few. And then he says some really interesting things that I've talked about before because, and they're so astonishing. We make a big deal of things sometimes in Buddhism. But Suzuki cuts to the chase, he says, if you discriminate too much, if you, ex you know, if you hold on to this versus that, if you reject this in favor of that, if you discriminate too much, you limit yourself, simply. If you are too demanding or too greedy, your mind is not rich and self-sufficient. And he's not really scolding us here. He really is speaking from a full compassionate heart and trying to help us. He says, I don't feel scolded and virtually anything can make me feel scolded. But this does not make me feel scolded. He says, if we lose our original self-sufficient mind, we will lose all precepts. When your mind becomes demanding, this is the picking and choosing mind. 
the mind that is demanding that wants this over that. Um, I would really not like, I would really like not to be dizzy. This is the way our things are. I would like what's not going on here, over here in my peripheral vision of my, of my right eye that just had the surgery. I'd like that not to be going on. But he says, if we lose our original self-sufficient mind, we will lose all precepts. Not to tell lies, not to steal, not to kill, not to be immoral, and so forth. And we think, what? I'm not tempted to kill. Sometimes I'm tempted to lie. I'm not really tempted to steal, but I have noticed at times a certain amount of emotional dishonesty can creep in. Um, my uh, psych license is due at the end of this month. And there is no way I'm gonna get around having to put in the time to read some books so I get enough CE credits to satisfy the licensing board. And I've been racking my brain trying to come up with ways short of lying <laughs> and saying, um, yeah, yeah, I've completed my CE hours. Don't think that hasn't occurred to me. Um, but I really don't want to lie. So um, he says, when your mind becomes demanding, when you long for something, you will end up violating your own precepts, not to tell lies, not to steal, not to kill, not to be immoral, and so forth. We all know how important really that is. Um, not to violate our own precepts. He says, if you keep your original mind, the precepts will keep themselves. In the beginner's mind, there is no thought. I have attained something. All self-centered thoughts limit our vast mind. Don't underestimate that. Don't underestimate the vastness of this mind of wholeness and totality. He says, when we have no thought of achievement, no thought of self, we are true beginners. Then he says, we can really learn something. The beginner's mind is the mind of compassion. When our mind is compassion, it is boundless. Dogen Zenji, the founder of our school, always emphasizes how important it is to resume our boundless original mind. Then we are always true to ourselves in sympathy with all beings and can actually practice. So in the Fukan Zazengi, Dogen says, regarding the boundless mind, he says, um, the Zazen I speak of is not learning meditation. It is simply the Dharma gate of repose and bliss, the practice realization of totally culminated enlightenment. Do not sell that short. It is the practice realization of totally culminated enlightenment. It is the manifestation of ultimate reality. In that wholehearted practice of Zazen, there is the manifestation of reality. He says traps and snares can never reach it. No. I have a little trouble with that because I often get caught by traps and snares in meditation. But he's saying in that moment where there is um, think not thinking, in that moment, traps and snares can never reach it. Once its heart is grasped, you are like the dragon when he gains the water, like the tiger when he enters the mountain. And it occurred to me recently those are images of um, ye, not ye so much, but when the dragon gains the water, the dragon, at least in Buddhist mythology, is a sea serpent. When the dragon gains the water, the dragon is in its natural element. Nothing impedes it. There's no, nothing impeding it, nothing obstructing or interfering with it. Similarly, the tiger, when she enters the mountain. So he's talking about that, that, um, arising all at once, uh, where there's this moment of just being fully present, fully aware, not distracted. Um, and I'm not saying that lasts, I'm saying this is something we come back to 
over and over in our practice. But I like that it's pointed out in the Fukanza Zenki because it's easy to forget. Um, and then for some reason, I have two more pages. 34 and 35, what's on those pages? Oh, yeah. So Benning gives us some really practical advice. Suzuki does, out of compassion. He says, easier said than done. When you are practicing Zazen, do not try to stop your mind. Let it stop by itself. So we're not trying to force anything here. He says, if something comes into your mind, let it come in and let it go out. Now I have noticed, it's okay for me to rub this eye, not this eye. I have noticed that sometimes my thoughts get stuck in the pipeline and um, letting them come in is one thing, but letting them go out sometimes is quite another thing. But he's bringing us back to that this can be done. Let them come in, he says, and let them go out. It will, they, it will not stay long thinking, Whatever it is that's, um, this thinking will not stay long. When you try to stop your thinking, it means you're bothered by it. I find that very interesting because you might no notice this annoyance that may come up. Oh, here I am distracted again. I'm thinking again in meditation. This is judging your meditation, which leads to confusion leads to discouragement, leads to maybe giving up the practice at some point. He's, and he's right when he says, when you try to stop your thinking, and you can't, by the way, you cannot stop it, to try to stop your thinking, however you try to do that, is only causing more disturbance and more agitation. And you can notice that in your own practice. You don't have to take my word for it. He says, do not, if you try to stop your thinking, it means you are bothered by it. Do not be bothered by anything. It appears as if something comes from outside your mind, but actually it is only the waves of your mind. And if you are not bothered by the waves, he says, gradually they will become calmer and calmer. In the next five or 10 minutes, ever at most, your mind will be serenely, completely serene and calm. At that time, your breathing will become quite slow while your pulse will become a little faster. But then he says, I like this. He's not trying to kid us. He's not trying to talk us into anything. He says, it will take quite a long time before you find your calm, serene mind in your practice. Many sensations come. Many thoughts or images arise, but they are just waves of your own mind. Nothing comes from outside your mind. This is why Wang Po says, we're totally mistaken when we try to get rid of the world. It's our mind that we have to deal with. That's why the Xin Qing Ming says, when mind vanishes, things follow it. He says, usually we think of our mind as receiving impressions and experiences from outside, but that is not a true understanding of our mind. The true understanding is that the mind includes everything. Nothing, when you think something comes from outside, it means only that something appears in your mind. So this is really, he's speaking about the richness and self-sufficiency of our mind. We think of it as delusion, but he's talking about another way of seeing it as well. He's saying, nothing outside yourself can cause any trouble. If you leave your mind as it is, it will become calm. This mind is called big mind. How should I go on? Um, If your mind is related to something outside yourself, outside itself, this mind is a small mind, a limited mind.
if your mind is not related to anything else, if your mind has not grasped something as separate from, as not mind, okay? Um, then there is no dualistic understanding in the activity of your mind. Big mind experiences everything within itself. Um, he goes on. Um, he said, and then he says, because he he was very diligent about not speaking dualistically and confusing us. He says. I just saw it. <laughs> Big mind and small mind are one. They're indistinguishable. He says, when you understand your mind in this way, you have some security in your feeling. Some security meaning you can have confidence in your practice. You can have confidence in um, the truth of immediate direct experience. And I don't want to try, you know, it sounds like I'm trying to sell you on something, but this is something you can find out for yourself. You don't have to take my word for it. Um, so he goes on and on, and I'm going to stop here. Um, he's really wonderful. Uh, I could go on and do another talk about him, but I'm going to stop for now. Any questions, comments? Insights, thoughts. I have, a, I have a question about um, why do you need basically thoughts versus memories? Because I'm thoughts versus memories? Yeah, let me stand a bit on that. So um, I have a sister. So I have a sister, and her memory is. That which much must have, I don't know if that originally started out as a thought or a change in the thought or the idea over time that when she walked into the kitchen and my dad was there, that the first thing is just after car accident, the first thing my dad said was, How's the car? But I heard a tape of that later on that wasn't the first thing. The first thing dad said was, How are you? <laughs> but then her, for years, a thought was, she thought dad didn't value the kids because she said that. But actually, her mind or her thoughts had flipped that thing along the way. Now, what I picked up from your talk is that when that thought would come up, that dad likes cars better, um, yeah. you should dismiss that. But yet, it was baked in. It was baked into her view of the world. Once again, that's a grasping mind. And to ungrasp it. I, you know what I mean? How, how yeah. does this play? Like long-term, in ideas. I have a problem with the word, with the expression baked in. I have a problem with that because um, it implies persistence. It implies that there's um, a thing there that has become set in stone, um, and that's simply not true. And I understand why you would say that about what your sister said, because it seems like there's this um, association for her between um, a belief maybe, an erroneous belief that your father did care more about the car than her and what she heard. But um, we don't always hear things accurately. And so, so to call something baked in implies you have to work. I don't know. I can't address what was going on with your sister, the dynamics. Yes. I get a thought. And I think, oh, that's an issue. I mean, that's a kind of, a nice what? I, I see something I haven't thought and thought goes through. I'm trying to differentiate between things that started out 
things that are, I mean, it is a thought because she's pulling from that memory of time. Thought versus memory. But it implies, to say it's baked in, implies that it's not going to change, okay? And I, 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 would, I would dispute that. And I would say that when your sister recounts that story, what shows up for her each time is what she thinks your father said. But it's not, um, but it's not something that has to occur. It's not something that has to be. To say it's baked in implies um, that has to be, that association is fixed solid, substantial. And I'm saying, not necessarily. I'm saying it is subject to change. Um, that's why people go to therapy. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 and I, yeah, that's her, her idea that her mind rewrote that early on. And then I don't, I don't, anyway, we won't go on. I was just curious, and to me, those are kind of, like, they do get the we do rewrite things. It's true. The mind is uh, the mind is an amazing thing. It's very active. Uh, I've misheard things. We've all misheard things, misinterpreted things. Um, and that's neither good nor bad, but it's not fixed. It's not real. It's not substantial. And It is subject to change. And so somebody, has anybody ever pointed out to her? That's actually not what he said. He sent her the recording. And what was, may I ask what her response was? <laughs> what? Crickets. She never said anything. She never said anything. Okay. And I'm not sure if she did. And it, no. I, I was done. I mean, I'm done. Okay. It is what it is. So we don't know. You don't? We don't know. And my mind is not bugging me to figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> well, that would be your problem, not hers. Yeah. <laughs> it's exactly. Um, yes, Catherine. I can fill in Zoom. Um, what is the reason, you might have said this, and I just didn't glossed over it or something, it was zoning out or something while that was going on, but um, regarding the precepts, why would it not be picking and choosing to choose to abide by the precepts? Why would choose that not be what? a choice? Why would that not be a choice? Cho picking and choosing. We talk about, yeah. um, you know, not picking and choosing. We have to make choices. And choosing. Uh, yes, we make a choice to um, prioritize not stealing, yeah. not lying, yeah. not killing. Yes, we make a choice. When I use the word, use the expression picking and choosing, I'm saying we, um, um, and we want this over that. We hold things. You now you can say, um, Okay, I'm holding up lying and then I'm holding up being honest. And I'm picking and choosing being honest over lying. You could say that. Um, but there's also another aspect to the precepts. Um, it talks about the one mind. And so these are the precepts of the one mind. And I'm venturing into territory I haven't prepared, but this, this one mind refers to not being caught by individually appearing objects, not being caught by that which sucks us in or pushes away. So this one mind is the mind of wholeness and totality and the precepts help us see this. Does that help at all? Yeah. I'm not trying to be evasive. It's a longer discussion, probably. I, I, I have to sort out. And Steve Hagen 
is going to help me out. <laughs> Here. Can you give Steve the microphone, please? He's not saying um, uh, don't pick and choose. We, we, we might hear it that yes. way, and then we, yes. we file it away, and that's how we remember until somebody gives us the recording or something. Then we can say, but, but we can look at, in this case, we can look at the document. And he's not saying don't pick. He, he's just pointing out that picking and choosing is the disease of the mind, the yes. dis-ease of the mind. Not saying don't pick and choose. Yes, yes. No, nobody's ever telling you in this in this practice that we have in this way, don't do this and do that. You might hear it that way. Sometimes it does get written down that way and passed on. But if we get back to what the awakened are helping us with, it's just pointing out that's what this is. Notice, notice what picking and choosing is. Notice what a picking and choosing mind is. That's all. The, the other part about what well, the picking and choosing, that's not good. So I should have a... Yeah, you know, yeah. But nobody's saying that. It's just see it for what it is. And, and once you see it for what it is, you can see what's causing pain, what's causing difficulty in your life, and that sort of thing. That's all that's necessary. This, this is not a dogmatic teaching or a dogmatic practice. Thou shalt not. And the precepts aren't handled in that way. They're just pointers. They're just pointing something out. You know? So we, we try to, we want, I would say, just see if you can keep that in mind at times. When you, if you start to notice, something being put upon you about this practice or this way. Look at that again. Well, I didn't necessarily bring that up because I feel like it's putting something on me to do that. But I, I no, 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 right, yes, yeah. I can see, you know, I try to reflect on why things show up as they do sometimes in, <laughs> in my mind. You know, and um, you know that that I mean I I know I I've never heard someone explain the way Norm puts all beings are mutually assisting one another in a better way than the way you put it today <laughs> because I well thank you unpack that in a way that makes me understand it differently helps me understand it differently thank um, you yeah um, but. You know, I mean, surely, I mean, I don't know, newscasts or what goes on in our world or people we meet or people, the things that go on. We do get bothered by some of it. We do. You know, it is troublesome. Some of what's we hear on the news yes. is very troubling. You know, yes. things that are going on in the world are troubling to us. Yes. And, you know, I I try to reflect on how someone could come to a place where they could feel that it is the right thing to steal or it is the right thing to kill. You know, I'm, I, I don't know. I mean, I just, I, I, I can, I try to put myself in someone else's shoes sometimes and to say, why is this showing up? Why is this person's behavior as it is? And you know, could I come to a place in my mind where I could see that certain things could converge however long ago or how they came up in the world or whatever, that it shows up that way to them. It doesn't show that up that way to me. But you know, there are differences in the way we do things in the world. And you know, I'm, ah, we get into conflict with one another over it. I mean, that's no news to anybody, but. I just, I just want to say, if I worry about why certain people have done certain things, and I, I can't, I mean, we all have hypotheses about why certain people have done certain things, and I'm not going to bring up names because it's, it disturbs my mind, you know? We can only see what disturbs our own mind. What other people's choices are, I can't, it's, it's, I, I have to look at my own mind. Right. I have to pay attention to my own mind. I really cannot disturb my mind and I disturb my mind enough as it is. I cannot disturb my mind with thinking about why somebody else would kill, steal, lie, 
um, I think claim the election is false, whatever, right. name it. But I mean, I just, I, I but guess. this is how we disturb our mind. I guess. This is how we disturb, and <laughs> this is you what. But it's time to jump in sciences, you know, that's not your business. Why are you making things that are your business that are not your business? I mean, I try, I, I don't know. Yes. It's my okay. need to discuss things. I don't know, in my mind, figure things out. <laughs> I guess I would say, notice the pain associated with that. Notice the suffering associated with that. I don't know what else to say. Did you want to add anything? Okay. Um, well, thank you. And we have gone over, and I appreciate your patience with me. And I hope I don't fall off. <laughs> out of here because I'm still busy. Thank you so much.